Welcome, welcome everybody. Um, we will, as always, give a few minutes uh, for everyone to trickle their way in. So do sit patiently, grab yourself a cup of tea, etc. make yourself comfortable and make sure you're muted. Be great if you want to start introducing yourself in the chat. That would be really lovely to say hi, who you are, etc. There are over 100 people registered for this uh, webinar. We're not expecting everyone to turn up, but as I say, we'll give, give, a, give people a few more minutes to get in. Maybe another minute. Okay, should we get started? Yeah, all right then, stop that. Uh, hi everybody, um, very warm welcome this evening. Very excited to be presenting this webinar. Um, as I said a minute ago, if you would like to introduce yourselves in the chats, that would be fabulous. Say who you are, where you come from. Uh, my name's Abby. I am the uh, organiser for the Southwest Scotland Regenerative Farming Network. Uh, it's a network of about 150, nearly 160 um, farmers from across southwest Scotland. Uh, and we are a kind of peer to farmer to farmer knowledge exchange group um, looking at all things agroecology, regen farming, etc. Um, most of the rest of this session is going to be the lovely Colin, uh, who is going to be um, telling us all about the soil food web. Very exciting. Um, I've got a bit of an official script to write, so to read out here. Um, the official script is, welcome to the third webinar of our Agroecology Enabling the Transition project, funded by the Scottish Government's Knowledge Transfer Innovation Fund. Our aim is to support the transition to agroecological practices in Scotland by supporting peer-to-peer -peer learning, where farmers, crofters, growers can come together and discuss, ask questions and learn from each other. We've set up six groups of farmers and crofters across Scotland, each with a different focus. Uh, we are also running 12 webinars, these webinars, uh, with experts to talk about different aspects of agroecology. Um, you can find out more about the project and sign up to our upcoming webinars using the link which I or somebody will put in the chat. Um, <laughs> wherever the chat's gone. <laughs> Pity Anders probably done it already. Uh, I'll do it again. Okay. Um, yeah, there's nothing much left for, more to, for me to say apart from I'll just hand over to Colin at this point. <coughs> and uh, can everyone be muted, please? Thank you. Ooh. Can we do the Mentimeter first? Oh, the Mentimeter, sorry. <laughs> okay? Good point. Okay. Yes, um, Diana is here from Nourish and she's going to guide us through the Mentimeter. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, no worries. Um, <laughs> thank you, 
everyone. Welcome to the event. So it would be great if you could head to menti.com on your browser. It usually works best by opening a new tab. I'm putting a link on the chat, so you can also just click, uh, click on that, and it should take you straight to the, to the website. Um, and I'm going to share my screen. It's just always nice to know a bit more of who's in the room today. So we're just going to ask you a couple of questions. I see some of you are already responding. So yeah, the first question is just, uh, which sector do you primarily work in? And also, if you would rather use the chat, please feel free to just put your answer on the chat. Sorry, I can't figure out how you put an answer. So if you go to the website, www.menti.com. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then it will ask you for a code. Oh. Yeah. And then I'll put the code in the chat so you can copy and paste that. And again, if you feel like it's just too much, please feel free to put it in the chat and we'll record your answer from, from there. Remember um, you have to submit. Oh yeah, that's also a good, good tip. <laughs> Submit your answer and then it'll be reflected. Uh, great, okay, I'm gonna go over to the next uh, slide, but if you're just logging in, you should still have a chance to respond to that first question. And so now we want to ask you, how confident would you feel explaining the soil food web to someone else right now, if you were put on the spot? And we'll ask you the same at the end of the webinar. Fairly confident, nice. Lightly confident, we have a, oh, completely confident, great. <laughs> Not confident at all, great. So it looks like we have a mixture of, of people in the room, which is great. And we were just saying that, yeah, that'll be good to, to have some knowledge exchange as well on this webinar. So we can all answer different questions. And I'll pass on to the next one. And great, I'm seeing some responses on the chat as well. So that's good. And so the last one that we wanted to ask you right now is, are you currently using any regenerative farming practices? Great. Okay, well, I'll leave the menti open, so please feel free to keep responding, and I'll just pass on to Colin now, and then we'll do this at the end of the meeting again. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'll share my screen. Uh... Sorry, lads. Yeah, so thanks for coming to this. I'm happy to ask me if I'd be if I would if I'd volunteer to do this. So happy to do so. Um, my name's Colin Russell. Um, I'm from Ramstein Farm. We're based in uh, Comores in North Ayrshire, just outside Kilmarnock. Um, myself and my wife, I moved to this farm in 2014. Um, I'd studied mechanical engineering, and when we moved there at the time. Um, I was working as a mechanical engineer, so um, I originally came from a farming background, although I wasn't actively involved in the farming. Um, so when we went to buy our own place, we wanted to get something with some land. Um, over since since 2014, um, I actually gave up engineering in 2016 um, because I was I was working away a lot. I was getting quite bored of it, and I was finding the, the farm a lot more enjoyable. Um, and then we officially started our business in 2019. I'm um, working from the farm. I'm um, so we both work at the farm. Although my wife is the primary teacher, I'm um, she used to work full time. She now works part time, two days a week, and the rest of the time she's on the farm. I'm um, since 2019. I've I, 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 um, I did my hostage management training. 
I and also joined the Regrading, just doing their training as well. Um, and then for the last two years, I've been studying with the Self Food Web School in America. It's a Wayne Ingram school. Um, and I'm, by the, hopefully by the end of this year, um, I should be a certified lab tech, which means I will be able to um, take soil and look at it under the microscope and give a, my, uh, give a biological assessment. So a little bit, just quickly about our farm. Um, it's 16 acres based in North Ayrshire. Um, our main enterprise is pastured poultry. So we do both layers and now broilers as well. Um, and we direct sell all of our produce. Um, we're also in the process of setting up a silver pasture uh, with a lot of orchard trees in there. Um, and we also have a small market garden and a, a shop that is uh, that my wife runs and that does um, fabric and eco paints. Um, and we also sell things like a bit of lamb and stuff um, as and when. Um, the, the land is heavy clay soils, uh, very heavy clay streaks that run through the land and it's very uneven ground, so it can be quite tricky at times. Um, we also have some sheep, uh, alpacas and a few pygmy goats. And I would like to point out that I am a farmer first. Um, and, you know, I'm, I've been studying the soil for two years now, but I've, you know, I've come to it from farming. I haven't come into it from a scientific background. Um, so this webinar is Soil, Web, uh, Soil Food Web for Farmers. Um, and this, we're just going to go through what the Soil Food Web is, what it's made up of, um, what damages it, and also what we can do to repair that damage. Uh, we're also going to quickly talk about the use of compost, extracts, and teas, um, and also how can we assess our Soil Food Web. So starting off, what is a Soil Food Web? This here is your classic picture of the Soil Food Web. This is one of Elaine Ingham's um, pictures that she's made up. Um, and basically, I'm going to start going from left to right in this picture um, and explaining it. And we'll go through each of the each of the different um, but, um, microorganisms in a bit more detail as we go through it. So starting off here, the, the, you know, the Soil Food Web is to explain um, they call it the poop loop. So it's to explain how how the system works and functions in, in, in a cyclical manner. And um, so like everything, it starts with the sun. And that's where the, the, the plants get all their energy from uh, to photosynthesize. Um, so above ground, the plant gets two nutrients. It gets energy from the sun and it gets its CO2. Um, and that plant takes the CO2, uses the energy to photosynthesize it, and it breaks it down. It releases the oxygen back into the atmosphere. And it takes the carbon and it draws it down into the plant. Some of it goes uh, above ground into the foliar parts of the plant. Uh, some of it goes below ground into the roots and depending on the plants, that, that percentage varies. And then what gets into the roots, about 50% of that will then be secreted as, as what they call root exudates, which is basically just liquid carbon. So the plant takes this and gives it out as a simple sugar. Um, so along with, so that when it emits that simple sugar, um, that immediately attracts um, what we call in here, the, the trophic levels. So that attracts the second trophic level, which is the decomposers. So the first one of that being the bacteria, um, they come in and um, they start consuming uh, these exudates. So I'm going to talk a bit more about the bacteria first. Um, bacteria are single-celled organisms. Um, and this picture is quite a standard picture of, of bacteria. It's just to give you an idea of the types of sh and shapes of bacteria. Um, that you can get. So the simplest one being the cocci, which is a round bacteria, um, all the way up to these complicated corkscrew looking ones, which are things like spirella and spirochetes. These are the disease causers. Um, the, the smallest bacteria is about one micron in diameter um, and um, very, very, very small. You know, they just look like tiny little pencil dots when you're looking at them under the microscope. Something's happened. Sorry, can we still see? Oh, yeah, there we go. Sorry. Uh, so, um, yes, so healthy soils will have approximately two and a half tons of bacteria per hectare. So, despite their minute size, you know, they have, they're in vast quantities in the soil, and that just gives you the kind of scale of that. Um, the fundamental decomposers, you know, and they are um, critical for the nitrogen cycle. Um, bacteria are really high in nitrogen. Their carbon to nitrogen ratio is somewhere between like five and ten to one. Um, so you know they need to consume a lot of nitrogen. 
and they they eat they generally eat simple sugars. So um they won't they won't they're not very good at breaking down complex carbon structures. So the simple sugars like the aldoses, the sucraloses, these sorts of things, glucose, um, these are what they break down. And um the the reason for this is that um they they basically produce one enzyme at a time and that's all they can do. So if they want to strip nitrogen off of uh, you know, a mineral particle or, or, or you know, some kind of sugar, then um, they have to produce one enzyme to then put out to strip that nitrogen off. And then if they want to get some phosphorus or potassium or whatever else, they have to stop doing that. They have to produce another enzyme that then can go in and take that potassium. So they're very, they're very um slow at, at breaking down in multiple different things but they're very, very good at breaking down simple things because they can break things down. If, they, if they're just going for nitrogen, they can break it down very quickly. So if you have soils that are don't have a lot of, you know, complex carbon chains in them, so say they've not got a lot of humates in them, um, you know, not a lot of organic matter, then the bacteria generally thrive more because they can outcompete fungi for simple stuff. Um, also, uh, they produce alkaline glues. So these glues that they secrete are what allow them to produce um, microaggregates in the soil. So as they move through the soil, these glues stick to the aggregates and then the aggregates can stick to each other. Um, and this is a this is a picture, like this is a little a, a scanned electron microscope picture of a microaggregate. So you can see here all the different types and um, all the little bits of, you know, it's the sand silts, the clay particles, the mineral particles all stuck together. Um, when, when your so soils are, bacterially dominant so there's there's not very much fungi then what you tend to find is you get an overabundance of fine aggregates and you the micro aggregates and you don't get as many macro aggregates and what can then happen is if you if you've got some bare soil that the aggregates and the surface can like collapse together and they basically create this like um, capping on the surface and then when that happens it stops the oxygen from getting in and the water from getting in um, and then things like your weeds are then um, called upon and they then germinate to break through this, you know, capped surface. Um, so, and I'll talk more about the, the macro aggregates with the um, fungi later on. They're also um, good at bioremediation. Certain bacteria are, are good at um, breaking down toxins um, and chemicals. Um, things like um, a, lot of, a lot of like agricultural chemicals that we use um, can actually feed bacteria. Um, so it's a bit of a it's a bit of a it's a bit of a double negative in that um, a lot of them can can kill fungi, but they can actually the 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 bacteria can actually break them down, and they're able to consume that as a form of food. So it allows them to proliferate even more. So it drives towards being more bacterial bacteria dominant, which is one of the other negative effects of using the chemicals. Not only does it kill things, but it can allow the bacteria to proliferate more. Um, so yeah, can feed on chemicals. Um, you also get um, actinobacteria. Um, this is like a filamentous bacteria, like you can see here. Um, and these are these are um, uh, bacteria that are they they can go between aer aerobic and anaerobic conditions. Um, so generally, if you see a lot of that, then that's a sign that your soils are starting to go anaerobic. Um, if you want to see what actino look like, the best way to do it is if you take a compost pile, and that sometimes if the compost pile gets very hot or very quickly, it can consume all the oxygen in the pile and then the actinobacteria tend to come in and if you fork a pile open and get into the hot centre, you might see a white ashy layer. That white ashy layer is the actinobacteria. Benefits, um, you can use them in, um, they are beneficial if you're growing brassicas, um, which don't like fungi. Um, you, can, you can have a bit of actino in there. They actually benefit brassicas to help them grow better. And you also get um, disease-causing bacteria. So on the right-hand side here, you'll see the corkscrew form, uh, the spirochetes, the vibrios. These are your pathogenic bacteria. You know, there, there's, some, there's, some, there's some pathogens, there's some not, but um, a lot of times if you see these, you would assume they're pathogenic. So these are your, um, your, your vibrios, your cholera, and spirella and spirochetes are things like your salmonella, your shigella, your pasturella, and all these things that you would get through food poisoning. So you generally want to try and avoid them. In your soils. Um, so moving on, um, so excuse me, um, we've then got the, the other uh, main decomposer we have is the fungi. 
And in this case, we're talking about mycorrhizal fungi, which has you know different mycorrhizal forms like ecto and endo within that, and also saprophytic fungi. And these are the fungi that break down, you know, they, they're the ones that consume the trees in the forest. So when the exudates come out, they come in as well because they want that carbon and they start feeding on the exudates and then forming a symbiotic relationship um, with, with the plants as well. So fungi are, um, when you look at fungi in the soil, they're in, they're in a hyphae form. So if you look up the top right here, this is a, 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 a bit of wood from the farm that we turned over. Um, and, and you can see how this looks like mycorrhizal fungi because you can see these individual strands. Well, those individual strands are actually hundreds and hundreds of strands all together, all built up to the point where they become visible by the naked with the naked eye. But uh, this picture on the left, you can see, is a one I've taken um, from some soil I was looking at, and that that's the, the, the strand you see come down here. That's a fungal strand. Now that's probably about as small as a beneficial fungal strand will get. That's about two two microns across, two and a half microns in diameter. So it gives you an idea of just how small they are. Um, they're the primary decomposers again. Um, they're, they're quite, they're almost like the opposite to bacteria in many ways. Bacteria produce alkaline glues. These guys produce acidic glues and acidic enzymes. Um, they use, their, their enzymes can be, be, can be very um, strong. So unlike bacteria that, that can only break down simple sugars, um, fungi can break down really complex stuff. Um, you know, if you think of like a, 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 humate, a humate molecule, it's incredibly complex and fungi can break that down. Um, they're very good at going in and breaking down the actual rocks, the pebbles, the sands, the silts, the clays, these sorts of things, and um, putting these acids in and, and getting out the minerals that they need. And then they then create this relationship with the plant where the plant feeds them sugars and they feed the plant whatever minerals it needs. Um, they also make the macro aggregates in the soil structure. Um, so in this picture here, you can see um, it looks like big crumbs here. This is all the this is all the microaggregates that the bacteria formed are now getting glued together uh, using the using the the hyphal glues, uh, the fungal glues uh, to make these macroaggregates. And this is when you start to get the bigger pore spacings. You get the oxygen into the soil. <coughs> you get the water flowing through. And you know this is when you increase your water holding capacity as well. And another thing fungi do is when they're out mining and they're taking the carbon and the hydrogen and the oxygen from various organic materials. Um, what they can actually do is they take the carbon and they take the carbon and they run it into the hypha and they store it in the cell walls of the hypha. And the cell walls are usually made from things like chitin and mannins, really dense carbon structures. And that's an incredibly stable form of carbon. So where bacteria, generally because they're really high in nitrogen, their CTN ratio is really short, um, when they consume nitrogen, they, they blow a lot of the carbon off as CO2, and that's why your compost pile um, smells, you know, you're, you're getting a lot of that CO2 from the from the poop from the um, bacteria, but the fungi don't do that, they take it and they store it in their cell walls, and it becomes it can be, it's in a very, very stable form, and it can live in the soil for thousands, ten thousand years you know, so they're absolutely critical for us, you know we always talk about climate change and drawing down carbon, well they're critical you know, they're one of the, the critical storage vessels for the carbon in the soil um, but the other thing they do is they take the hydrogen and the oxygen and they form H2O, which is water. So they can also generate water from this process up to when they're doing this up to 20 percent of that can be water. So if you think about, you know, water home capacities in soil, well, if you've got healthy fungal amounts, then they can actually be generating the water from stuff they're breaking down and releasing it back into the soil and, and you know, watering the roots of the plants as well. So that's why you get much more drought tolerance. Very good at mineral release, uh, especially things like um, phosphorus, you know, which is a, which is a much needed element. Um, and also more fungi isn't always better. And this may sound really counterintuitive, but <clears throat> you can get soils that have a lot of fungi um, and the fungi can actually be quite sleepy. So they're not very active. They're not doing much. They're not cycling nutrients much. And a lot of times in these soils, um, you can get a lot of woody species of weeds coming up um so so the real the real early shrubs that are going to come in before the trees um and that's not always desirable especially if you've got something like a pasture land the other thing as well is in soils you have what's called the fungal to bacterial biomass ratio and uh, 
this is you know this is this is fungal versus bacteria um, and and the ratios they have per gram of soil um they're not always um it's not always beneficial to just have the highest fungal um relative to bacteria um this is a successional thing so generally early in succession when you start with a bare field it'll basically have no fungi at all and it'll start with bacteria and then as you move through from things like you know the early successional crops like wheat and then you move through and you start getting to your brassicas and then into your early grasses and then into your, your later successional grasses, the, the fungi start to increase. So your ratio starts to come up. And then if you're in a healthy pasture, you're looking at something like a one to one or a two fungi to one bacteria ratio. So if you start seeing fungi and it's much higher and it's maybe up five or 10 to one, then that's going to want to start progressing towards forest. So um, you know, it's not always beneficial. It depends what you're managing for, you know. Um, so you can you the good thing is you can you can make teas and compost and you can shift these things as well if you're trying to shift it towards maybe more woody uh, species. And the other thing is fungi is very sensitive. Um bacteria are much more uh, robust. Fungi are sensitive to any form of um disturbances and things like that. Um, chemical applications, all of that, and um, it really affects them hard. So it's very, it's very easy to destroy them in the soil. Whereas fungi, uh, whereas bacteria, um, they have the ability in the right conditions to multiply every twenty minutes. So even though you can kill a lot of them, they can also regenerate very quickly. Whereas fungi can't. So you know you've got to be thinking of your fungi when you're thinking about soils and, and what you're doing with soils. So moving on from the bacteria and the fungi, we get to the next trophic level. And this is your shredders and your predators and your grazers. <clears throat> so these are the guys that now come in and start consuming on the bacteria and the fungi and pooping them out in, a, in, a, in an in organic mineral form. You know, like they'll start creating things like ammonium and stuff that the plant can take up. So these guys are critical. If you don't have these, your, your growth of your plants would be, you know, severely reduced um, because there's not enough mineral um plant available for minerals um so we'll look at the protozoas first um these are made up of amoeba and this is an image here in the top right you can see this one in the middle is as a, as a circular amoeba um and just here on the right this is what you call the pseudopod so this is like it's false feet if you like this is it just sticking out and that's almost as far as that pseudopod will come out so you can get them both naked and you can get them in tests um, this one here, and also this this big yellow one here is, uh, is also an amoeba. These are both testated, so the, the cytoplasm lives inside the test um, and then only comes out when it needs to consume bacteria. Um, they, they consume, they, they live on bacteria, um, and they're a sign of aerobic conditions. So if you're seeing a lot of amoebas in the soil, that's generally considered a good sign. Um, it most likely means that your soils are in, in an aerobic state. Uh, they come in many different forms. I mean, you can see just from these two pictures just how different they are, you know, of slime moving through um, moving through the, the slides. Then the next one you get is flagellates. Um, and you can see the picture on the right-hand side here. Flagellates are the smallest of the protozoas. This picture is um, far more zoomed in than this one. So that flagellate is probably going to be similar to the size of these little pseudopods here. And um, they're called flagellates because they have a flagella, and that is this little <clears throat> hair-like structure that you see here. And that structure is what moves it. So the actual body has no way of creating motion. And these flagellates can they can whip round or they can wiggle, and that pu pu pulls them through the soil. It either pulls them or pushes them. But generally, when you're looking at them under a microscope, they're very they're very quick and very rapid and moving about in all directions. And they're also a sign of aerobic conditions. Uh, the third thing we have, the other, third protozoa that we concern ourselves with is ciliates. Um, now, ciliates are called ciliates because like flagellates, they have little hairs on their body called cilia. And uh, I took this picture up from online because you can it's a really good clear picture and you can see all these tiny little hairs all the way around it. And that's the cilia. And that's what, again, what allow, allow it to move. Um, and unlike flagellates, ciliates kind of, they, they move very smoothly through the soil, very calmly. Um, Ciliates are what we call facultative. So that means that they can go from a both anaerobic and anaerobic conditions. So generally, if you're seeing if you're seeing a lot of ciliates um, in your soil, 
then it's usually an indicative sign that your soils are either going anaerobic or have gone anaerobic. Um, because silates are far more common in um water systems, you know. So if you're looking at ponds and things like that, this is where you see a lot of the cilia. So you've got to be wary of these guys. So moving on, um, we have the nematodes. So these are the nematodes cross three trophic levels. Um, the reason for this is that you get the, the second trophic level there, you get um, root feeders. Um, well, sorry, I'll start off by saying that 95% of nematodes are good. 5% um, are probably bad. But all we ever hear about is bad nematodes. So when I'm talking about nematodes from a farming point of view, I'm thinking about either root feeding nematodes. So, so if nematodes are eating the roots of my plants and they can decimate crops, they can severely weaken them. Or talking about something like nematoditis, where you have, um, you know, in lambs, you know, that can kill lambs very quickly. But the, major the vast majority of nematodes are actually really good. Um, the, the bad guys are the root feeders. So they're in the second trophic level there, and that's because they can come in and they can consume the plant um, and consume its roots and, and you know, kill a crop if there if are um, enough of them. And I think to note about root feeders is they, they thrive in high EC, high electrical conductivity soils. So the higher the electrical conductivity in your soil, the more they thrive. And a lot of times the, the nematicides that people use to try and kill root feeding nematodes and crops, they, they, they actually increase the electrical conductivity of the soil and therefore make it more beneficial for root feeders to come in. So you get into this kind of cyclical pattern of spraying nematicides and then the nematodes come back quickly because it's beneficial for them because there's a higher EC. And then you spray it again and you get in this kind of downward spiral. Um, so, you know, you've got to be wary before you put these chemicals um, on the soil. The good guys, um, uh, which are in the third trophic level, are the bacterial and the fungal feeders. Um, and then in the fourth level, you also get the predators. So the bacterial and the fungal feeders, like they stay, they eat bacteria and they eat fungi. This picture up the top right here is of a bacterial feeder. It's got a little long mouth here. Um, and the predators um, can be, they're, they're basically ones that come in and they consume uh, uh, other nematodes. So predators are good, especially if you've got root feeders. If you can get predatory nematodes in the system and get it functioning, they'll come in and eat the root feeders and take that down. And the other thing as well is you get a, you get a type of fungus called a nematode trapping fungus. Really, really cool. It's a fungus, and when you look at it under a microscope, it basically creates, as it goes round, as a hypha goes along in a string, it creates these loops, and these loops sit in the soil, and these loops actually secrete exudates, same as a plant does. They're mimicking plant roots, and that, that attracts the root feeders. So they go, oh, this is a plant. I need to go in here and, and, and eat the roots. And they come in, and when they, when they get to that ring, as soon as a bit of their body goes through the ring, the ring immediately fills up and um, clamps. It fills up with water. And it clamps down on the on the nematode, and and the nematode dies quite a slow and painful death, unfortunately. Um, but you can actually you can actually take um, nematode trapping fungus and use it as a as an application to get rid of um, root feeding nematodes. You know, as a kind of safe application. Um, and yeah, they, they they consume. I mean, they consume pretty much everything. The soil, the bacteria, the fungi. They can consume protozoa as well um, and other nematodes. So the other thing that we're going to look at is um, the arthropods um, and the earthworms. So this is both micro and macro arthropods. <laughs> Similar to, to um, nematodes, you know, they come in and they consume whatever they can fit in their mouth, basically. Um, they're, they're the higher level nutrient cycle, uh, cyclers. So, you know, these, these levels keep going up and up and up. Um, and they consume fungi, bacteria, and other predators, so larger um, and my, my, microarthropods can consume microarthropods and, and earthworms can consume some all of them. Um, the, one of the real benefits that arthropods and earthworms have is um, fungi and, and uh, can, can translocate nutrients like through its hyphal system, but the fungi itself stays set in the soil and, and all it does is extend and grow longer. The actual microarthropods can move through the soil so they can actually take nutrients, they can take fungi, they can take 
bacteria on their body, you know, they stick to them. And as they're moving, they can then take them to new places. So they help to spread the, the microorganisms through the soil and um, to enable them uh, to kind of bloom out um, across across the soils. So very important, you know, they call them the taxi cabs. Um, and just a quick bit on earthworms. Earthworms are, you know, we, we talk a lot about earthworms in the soil and earthworms are, are strictly aerobic. What I mean by that is they will take um, the anaerobic like bacteria, things like the disease causers, the spirillas and the spirochetes, and when they consume them, they kill them. They get killed inside their gut because their gut only, only allows aerobic bacteria to survive. So earthworms are also great for remediation. They've done studies on them where they've put them in heavily toxified, they've basically made up soils that, and they've, they've um, inf inoculated those soils with like lots of E. coli. And then they've put in um, earthworms. And once the earthworms are eaten through all the soil, they couldn't detect any E. coli. So, you know, great remediators again as well. And on top of the burrowing and the tunneling that they do to create channels for air and water. You also get microarthropods called switchers. Um, so these can be things like your kalimbala. Um, switchers are ones that if you have good healthy soils and you have good fungal count in your soil, good fungal biomass, then the kalimbala would just eat on the fungi. But if you're lacking in fungi, they'll switch and they'll start eating the roots of the plants. So they're, they're, they're beneficial if you've got healthy soils and they're detrimental if you don't. So you've got to be wary of them. So I'm going to move on now to what, a point I would like to say before I move on to this is that if you if you look at the soil food web, we've taken it from biology, from, from bacteria and fungi, and we've worked through those trophic levels. But that then goes on to then birds eating the worms, you know, and rodents eating worms. And then, you know, eagles coming in and eating the rodents. And that just continues up. And that gets to the point to where it's like, you know, uh, ruminants and herbivores and then humans eating them. So, you know, the whole entire food chain is that's it. That's the absolute basis of it. You know, without plants in the ground, we don't have any soil. Um, so, you know, we, we must look after look after it and understand these systems um, and, and get them get them thriving. So what damages soil biology? Um, it's probably not. It's probably obvious to most people um, is disturbance. Um, any form of tillage, you know, plowing, um, disking, harrowing, whatever. Um, if you're turning that soil over in any way, that's damaging, especially um, to the fungi, you know. And when you turn this soil over, everything's exposed to the, the sunlight, you know, and the atmosphere and um, they die. So the, 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 the fungi gets all chopped up, the bacteria get oxidized and then the fungi die and they oxidize. And basically when the bacteria die, they just blow off as like nitrogen gas. And, and all the fungi, all the carbon that's in them oxidizes and blows off as CO2. So you're losing your carbon stores in your soil, which is what holds all your moisture in the soil. And you're also losing all your nutrients. You're blowing off all your, all your uh, various nutrients. So, you know, incredibly detrimental. So um, that's the first one. The second one is obviously chemicals. Um, you know, we talk about it all the time, all the, all the different acides, you know, acides from the Latin to kill. Um, so, you know, they, they kill, you know, whether it be nematocytes or fungicides or anything like that. Um, they, they kill the soil biology as well. You know, they don't discriminate. So if you're applying these things, um, you've got to be really careful because you've got to understand the effects it's going to have on your soil. And generally, a lot of the time spraying these, the, the problem it solves at the time is, is minor compared to the problem it creates in the soil long term. So you have to try and think more longer term. Uh, the other thing is fertilizers. So we, you know, we put out all these inorganic fertilizers all the time. Um, these kill the, these kill the soil as well. They kill the microbes in the soil, um, and their salts. So the other thing they do is they, they because the salts are charged and the water molecules actually stick to them. Um, the same same way, you know, if we put salt in water and we drink salty water, that osmotic pressure actually draws the water out of our cells and dehydrates us. It does the same in the soil. It dehydrates your plant because your plant can't access that water. It's there. So, you know, um, we've got to be incredibly careful with that as well. Um, the other thing, which is no surprise, is glyphosate, you know, the, the world's best weed killer. Um, glyphosate is, you know, it's just, it's harmful. It's, it just, it just kills, you know, that's what it does. And 
and they've done trials on glyphosate where they've sprayed it in a crop field. And then the following year, they've measured the fungal biomass again, and they've found that they've lost 25% of the fungal biomass, you know, just from that one spray of glyphosate. So you imagine how much next year's crop um, suffers as a result of having less um, fungi about. So you've got to be wary. The other thing as well is wormers. Wormers are wormers are really bad, uh, especially for things like bacteria, you know, they and 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 the protozoas. Wormers are designed to kill protozoas, they're designed to kill nematodes, you know, in the gut of animals. Um if you if you're making compost heaps and you use a lot of manure from this this that's got wormer in it, so say it's manure that's just come out of an animal that's just been wormed, then a lot of times you find the compost pile won't won't generate any heat or very little heat. And that's because the bacteria are, are dead. They they can't thrive because the wormer's killing them. Um, so you've got to be wary of that, and that's one of the big, you know, we, we worm a lot, you know, we worm every year if we have to, um, so it's something we've got to consider. Um, sorry, I put fertilizers in there twice, <laughs> forgot to take that out. Um, the other thing is overgrazing, um, set stocking animals uh, and leaving them in the fields for, for a long, for you know, a month at a time or whatever. Um, these animals will go over and graze the same bits of grass. Um, and they'll nip away at it. And as, just as the grass is regrowing, um, they'll come back and eat at it again because that's the, the sweet, sugary bits of the grass that they like. This, when you, when you continuously do this, what happens is when normally when grass gets eaten, so if it's fully recovered and then an animal comes in and eats it, and then you move the animal on quickly so it doesn't come back to eat it before it recovers, what the plant does is the plant just, as soon as it gets eaten, it sends a flush of exudates out into the soil to attract all the beneficial organisms to get it the nutrients it needs to start its growth again. But if you do that repeatedly, then what happens is it doesn't have enough energy and it has to start shedding its roots because it can't support the root system. Um, and those roots then become shorter and shorter. And that when they become shorter and shorter, there's less roots, there's less photosynthesizing happening. Therefore, the, the microbes don't get the food that they need and the relationships start to break down. And then you get compaction, not only from the animals constantly walking on the ground, but from the fact that the microbes aren't there to create the passageways, you know, and decompact the soil. So how, how can we repair soil? <clears throat> I mean, this is just basically the inverse of the last slide. Minimise tillage. Um, you know, I appreciate these things can be hard, especially in like certain arable settings. Um, but the less, the less damage, the less turning over of soil you can do, um, the better, you know, and we're generally now we're seeing a we're seeing a big a big um, surge in, in things like no dig market gardens, you know, where people are understanding that you know we need to get these um, fungal relationships growing and thriving, and we can't keep turning the soil over, and they're just applying compost. Um, a hundred percent ground cover, hundred percent of the time, and this is something that you know on our farm we aim for. This this is our kind of one of our goals is we aim to have a hundred percent ground cover, a hundred percent of the time. So you should always be trying to strive towards that. If there's no roots in the ground, there's no photosynthesizing. There's no, there's nothing for the bacteria and the fungi, you know, to, to consume on. So absolutely uh, uh, critical. And also we can apply biology. Um, so, you know, we can look at the soil and we can go, okay, we're maybe missing some fungi, we're missing some protozoas, you know, let's, let's make some teas up, some extract. And let's get that those those missing organisms back into the soil to try and help accelerate accelerate that regeneration of soil, and that's a lot of what the soil food web focuses on. You know, is 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 doing exactly that, trying to get that acceleration happening. And um, also look to reduce chemical inputs. Now that can be very hard because um, when soils are damaged and degraded, they very much rely on a lot of the chemicals. So to just cut chemicals out and just say, well, I'm going to stop today and I'm never going to use them again. Um, you can get kind of withdrawal symptoms and basically crops can fail quite dramatically. You know, you could really put yourself in a, a financial, um, a tricky financial position. So, you know, unless, unless you've got really robust um, measures in place um, and, and, and protocols to start applying that biology and getting it in the soil, um, you're, you're better to wean yourself off these things because, you know, applying them kills the biology. And then if you're applying fertilizer and it kills the biology, the plant is dependent on the fertilizer for its nutrients. So when you take it away that next year, the biology hasn't had a chance to come back and thrive. And the plant now doesn't have the nutrients from the fertilizer. So, you know, what does it do? It, it, it struggles. Um, so, you know, look to start reducing them um, gradually, you know, reducing them down less and less. 
um, or, or start applying biology in huge amounts and getting them down quite quickly. The other thing um, is regenerative grazing practices. Um, <clears throat> this is a picture of our farm up the top here, and you can see all the patches here where we move the chicken every couple of days, and then we allow the ground to recover. Um, if you can do any, any if, you, if you've got cattle or sheep or, or you know, chickens, any form of uh, animals that you're moving about in the land, if you can move them more often, um, you know, divide fields up into smaller areas and move them more often and give each section of land longer to recover, then that'll be beneficial because those plants can grow taller, uh, they can fully recover, they can photosynthesize more, and then that allows the biology to start getting better because the plants are getting more photosynthesis into the ground and getting stronger. Um, and the other thing as well, it's quite obvious, is minimize machinery. You know, um, if you run over ground repeatedly, you will create compaction. That stops the, you know, the, the water getting in, stops the oxygen getting in, things go anaerobic, and the anaerobic guys, uh, microbes start moving in. So a bit about compost extracts and teas. Um, compost um, is an incredibly powerful tool, and this is something I learned uh, in my studies. Um, we make compost, and we make it so that it's full of life, um, and we can use this. And what's great about the compost is um, you'd not, it, it, you can you can spread the compost directly onto soil, um, but that you would need a vast amount of compost to do that uh, because there's a minimum amount you would have to spread on each acre. Um, the machinery would spread, basically. Um, so what we do instead is we make extracts um, and we make teas. Um, the difference between them is it, we talk. I think we talk about extracts and teas quite interchangeably. Excuse me, I'm just going to take a drink. The difference is that extracts are a, are a quick um, process, much like brewing a cup of tea. Um, <clears throat> we put some soil, we put some compost in a big tea bag and we put it in water and we just squeeze it and we massage it about. And what we're doing is we're taking out all those organisms into that water. And then we check that uh, under a microscope. We make sure it meets minimum biological requirements and that it has what we need in it for what we're trying to do. So for if we're short of protists, we make sure it's got the protozoas in there. Um, and then we spread that on the ground. So that's for soil drenching extracts. Um, teas, on the other hand, we brew. We brew teas. We brew them for like 24 hours, you know, maybe longer, depending on... Um, how long it takes to multiply the organisms and we generally add some kind of feed um, and it's usually to grow things like the fungi because you don't really have a problem multiplying bacteria you can add a little bit of molasses but you've got to watch because bacteria can multiply so quickly even with the smallest amount of molasses that the water can go anaerobic even though you're pumping air through it um, and the difference between tea and extract is over that 24 hours the microbes that they create these glues the, the, the glues we were talking about earlier on um, and these glows make them sticky. So you, you can't feel when you put your hands in the water, but then when you spray that, they stick to whatever surface they're on. So you use a tea for foliar application. So if you've got disease on a tree or something like that, um, you can spray it out. And what they do is they displace, they, they kill the disease and displace it. And, and then they cover the whole surface of the plant and they stop disease from getting in. They create an impenetrable barrier. Um, if, you, if you try to do a soil drench with a tea, what generally happens because you're spraying, you're usually spraying this out in a fine spray, fine mist, because you're trying to get it out over a large area of land. It just sticks to the grass and it doesn't, it doesn't run into the soil. So in order for it to penetrate, we want to use extracts. <clears throat> the other thing says we should always assess these for quality, your compost, your extracts, and your teas. Um, you need to know what you're putting down. You, so you need to assess your, your, your actual soil. Um, for you know, if you're looking at just if we're talking purely about microbial assessments, you need to assess the soil, see what's there and what's missing. A lot of times that can give you, indi you know, you can be seeing indicators with your eyes, and then when you look at the soil, you can realize that by seeing certain things are missing. And then um, you've got to apply, you know, if, you're, if they're missing certain things, you want to make sure you're applying them. So you've got to make sure that your compost is, is good quality, you know, it's got all the different um, soil food web within it. Um, and that you're applying, you know, when you're applying extracts and teas, you're not just throwing out brown liquid, you're actually throwing out meaningful product. Um, so it's always important, you know, you may, you may throw us out and it may see a change and then you might do it next year and there's no change and that could be because one year you had good compost and next year you didn't. 
And so it's also important to put it under a microscope and check. Um, and yeah, like I said, what is missing from the soil biology? Um, so how do we assess it? Um, quite obviously, we've been talking about it. If we're talking about just the soil food web, um, the, only, the, the best and most accurate way, and really the only way you can do it is a microscope analysis. You know, we have to physically look at the soil under a microscope and see the individual organisms, you know, and count them and make sure that we've got, you know, the right quantities for whatever land we're managing and see what's missing. Um, you can also do things like a Haney test. Um, so you get all your standard chemical tests. Um, they use really strong like acids and solvents to break the soil down to get the minerals out to check what's in them. The problem with that is, is it's not it's not really applicable in the real life biological world because a lot of those a lot of those minerals might not be available to the plant at the time. <clears throat> you know, so you're looking at total you know content, um, and a lot of that might not actually be available to the plant. So even though you could say, oh, soil's got great levels of you know phosphorus, whatever, the plant might not be able to access that, and vice versa. It might say, oh, you've got really low levels of, of phosphorus, but when the biology is cycling it properly, the plant actually doesn't need what we think it needs. Um, so a, a good test to do is the Haney test instead. And what the Haney test does is it measures soil respiration. So it takes soil and it measures the CO2 coming out of the soil. And it's, it's a good general indicator of how much microbial life is in the soil. You know, how that because that life, you know, it breathes, you know, it lives and breathes. Um, you know, they poop out, they poop out carbon and CO2, et cetera. So a Haney test is another good test to do. And um, other than that, get your spade, dig a hole, you know, start looking at your soil, you know, look, look, look at it, look for compaction, you know, look for hard pans, uh, check the crumb structure of it, you know, look at the roots of soil sticking to the roots. Does it get big dreadlocks, you know, is it good aggregate structure on there? You know, I know our, um, the South Red Region Network has a, a soil health group. And then um, within that group, we've we've signed up to Soil Mentor. Um, great app. I'd highly recommend that for people as well. And um, they go through all these all these tests, really good intuitive uh, videos on how to do all these different tests. And you can go out and you've got the app. You can keep, take it out on your phone in the field. You can record your location. You can um, record all these all this data. You know, and you can track it. You know, so um, you need to be you need to be looking at the soils. Um, otherwise, you can't manage them. You know, if you don't know what's happening. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Hopefully people haven't fallen asleep. <laughs> um, it's quite a lot to take in. Um, but thank you very much for listening. And um, if you've got any questions, please um, feel free to, to unmute and, uh, and ask away. And I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. You know, I'm, I, I will say that, you know, I'm, the, the more I learn, the less I feel like I know it sometimes, you know, there's just so much. It's such an in-depth subject. Um, but I will try my best to answer any questions. That's fabulous, Colin. Thank you so much. Um, there have been some questions coming in as we've been okay. going through. Um, do you want to you stop sharing your screen and then we can yeah, see everybody? Bad, That's um, my details, by the way, if anyone wants. <laughs> if it just Sorry, just to say before I stop sharing, if anyone wants to, if, 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 you know, if they've got a question that they want to ask me, they can't ask tonight or something more in detail, please get in touch. You know, email me, phone me, whatever. Happy to help. Brilliant. I mean, I, I, I sat through that with Colin last night and I'm just as fascinated um, tonight as I was last night in the dress rehearsal. It's like, oh my God, this is amazing. Um, a really good time to remind to me as a, as a market gardener at a time when I'm meant to be covering all my beds with um, organic matter that I've borrowed off, uh, off local farmers and stables. Um, you mentioned, obviously, the wormer. You know, pe people have asked me in the past why isn't my manure heap heating up but now I know what to tell them I didn't really know what to tell them before um but um yeah uh what what is, is there a that time of year that people various things huh the, the manure heat not heating up can be various things that a lot of times it's down to warmers or or some kind of chemical um you know, you know. and and the other thing is things like um broadleaf weed killers that kill like dokens and um, they're like clopyrrolids and things like that they don't they don't break down and they don't break down in the composting cycle, the heating phase. So what you can get is you can actually produce compost and it heats up well. But then what you have is you go and you, you plant your potatoes and things in it and they'll die. And it's because those copyrights take years to break down, you know. So um, when we're making compost, we 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 try to find good sources of manure, you know, um, if we can't get it from our own farm. 
and then we, we tried to stick with him. I mean, I, I've been making compost for donkey's years. I'm pretty confident my compost is okay, but even with like yeah. several cubic meters of it, it's just not enough. It's never enough. <laughs> yeah, it's um, never enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. I'm gonna try and monitor the hands up in the in the participants list at the same time as looking at questions in the chat. Um, and Diana's gonna help with that, aren't you, love? <laughs> um, but we had a couple of questions in. Um, well, Diana, you had one. Do you, want to, do you want to just go for it right away? I did have a question, um, but I think it might have been answered in that last uh, section where you were telling us about the different soil tests. Um, yeah. But yeah, what basically what I was wondering is, so you mentioned that if people are using fertilizers and then plants become addicted to them, but if you take yeah. them out just like that, that's financially risky. So, yes. and so you would need to have a good understanding of your like soil biology to be able to yes. do that. So I was wondering, yeah, like what are the tools available for farmers to be able to have that understanding? Um, are they accessible? Or then I was wondering if another way, I don't know if this is feasible at all, but you do like little bits of land, like you do a bit here, like you do it little by little or yeah, what yes. is a situation basically? Yeah, so, so that last bit, doing it little by little, um, there's there's a lot of practitioners that um, are really, really, really keen when they, when they, you know, when they consult with people or farms that they do safe to fail trials. Um, and a lot of times it's because, you know, if you walk onto a farm and say, right, you can't use fertilizer, they go, oh, why not? You know, it, it's a, it's a shock. You know, a lot of times when that's, that's what you know, that's what you've been doing your whole life. Um, so to try and convince, a lot of times try and convince people, they say, let's set up a trial. Let's take, if it, you know, let's take one acre or whatever. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll stop doing that or we'll start, you know, intensively grazing it or we'll apply biology to that and, and see what happens. And these are good things to give you an indication of what will most likely happen, you know, rather than just doing it over your whole crop, because, you know, that could that could put you out of business, you know, in, in one year, you know, if, if your entire crop fails. Um, if you want to stop it quickly, um, then, then, you know, getting the right biology back into the ground is key, you know, um, and, and, the the, the, best, I mean, the best way to do that is and, and something we're looking at setting up just now is you know making making compost that are you know Elaine Ingham has trademarked them as what she calls biocomplete because you can't you can't trademark compost so she calls them biocomplete and that means they meet a minimum specification and we're looking at the moment at trying to you know start making that kind of compost and have it so that if people want to start making extracts we can we can supply compost to them and they can you know buy relatively cheaply you need like you know, to do to do like a, I mean, I can't remember the exact numbers, but you know, you could probably do an acre with one kilo of compost. You know, and um, because you need, you only need the bacteria, you only need the biology there to start growing. You know, you don't need to have the entire amount of biomass there in one go. You just need to get it in, and it'll start doing its thing. And um, so, yeah, biology is the main thing. And the other thing you can look at is, you know, your your soil may not necessarily need a broad array of um, um, fertilizer, you know. So there's a, there's a lot of farms now when they're growing crops and things. They they start doing things like they'll they'll, they'll plant the seed, but they'll also they'll also put some like maybe some boron or something, whatever the, the single nutrient that they're fishing in 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 with the seed, you know, so that when it germinates, it has that there to help support it, you know. So they're being a bit more specific as well. That's another way to start transitioning off of just general fertilization, but unfortunately you know you have to get that biology back in the ground um so you know applying the biology is you know it's what it's what i've been taught you know is to is to do that so and it's it's you know something we're looking to set up is to help people with that you know if we can help supply biology or help make the teas and the extracts and spray it for them or whatever you know and that's what we'd like to do Thank you, Colin. There's another question in the chat higher up that yep. was, what about using effective microorganisms as they are facul... Uh, no idea how you pronounce that. Facultative? Facultative. Facultative, yeah. that one. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, this is one of these things where I'm um, the... When you, when, certainly when you were in the soil food web school, you, you don't go much into the, the, effect, the effective microbes and things like that because um, she, she, she talks about you know, she tries to separate aerobic and anaerobic 
Um, and, and there definitely is a place for, you know, like biofertilizers. You know, they, they, they do work. But um, in terms of the good guys and the bad guys, all the learning I've done has been that, you know, if it's anaerobic, it's bad. If it's aerobic, it's good. But I know that isn't the case, but I think she differentiates them and keeps them as good and bad to make it easy learning for people, you know. So um, it's not something I can comment much on in terms of the, the kind of the more... Um, um, biofertilizer side of things, you know, but but they are good. I mean, there's many good examples of people doing them around the world, you know, much more natural way. Um, I don't know if it's a case of, and this is this is me pondering, <laughs> if it's a case of, um, that that is that is literally got the, the the nutrients in it in a bioavailable form because the microbes have made it in a bioavailable form, even if they're, you know, aerobic or anaerobic, they're still consuming it and processing it. So I don't know if it's the fact that when you put it on, you're literally putting nutrients on as much as it is putting biology on. I'm not sure. But sorry, I can't go any more than that. Thanks. There's been a few suggestions in the in the chat. So I think Jay, Jamie's suggesting micro library and uh, Daniel saying as a Facebook group, that might be the same one. But um, yeah, if you, if you kind of want to jump in with a with a response, one of you guys, then it sounds like you might you might know something <laughs> what says it's in microbe micro library. library jamie somerville says micro library sounds quite interesting i don't know if that's a, that's a facebook group or what yeah i'd like to know more about that yeah click on the link maybe that he's posted above there um oh, is he posted the link okay yeah yes the link he says yeah uh little, little, uh heather um heather do you want to read your question out heather g um or so shall i read it for you Feel free to unmute. I'll give you a few seconds. Oh, I can read it out for you if you like. <laughs> um, is there a website or a YouTube recommendation? Oh, bloody chat is jumping about. Um, website, YouTube recommendation for learning what to look for and how to recognize what can be seen using a microscope. It's a very good question. So we haven't got to yes. like pay someone like Colin Russell. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, the <clears throat> YouTube's, I mean, YouTube for that uh, is <clears throat> a fantastic resource because you're generally going to be watching videos, you know, uh, of microbes because you have to see them live. Um, so uh, one, one that I like, it's not necessarily um, soil based, but just to learn about the world of microbes in general. And there's a lot, there's a lot of like um, a, a more of the pond side of things is, is, um, Journey to the Microcosmos on YouTube. Um, it's this boy James. I think he lives in Poland. Um, but he's got really phenomenal um, mic microscopy equipment, you know, and he, and he shows you stuff in incredible detail and a lot of ciliates and stuff on that channel. You know, they call Paramecia. Um, that's great because it. I like it because it's um, it's well put together. The cinematography of it is actually really good. And there's a there's a guy that narrates it all, um, and it's just really interesting. Um, so that, that'll, that'll definitely get you addicted on. And there's there's tons of tardigrades on there, you know, the water bears or moss piglets, whatever you want to call them. I know Abby's a fan. Um, so, yeah, that's always a good channel. Um, the Soil Food Web themselves do have, I think, have some might have some stuff on there. Um, but generally, there's a lot of people. I think there's one guy called Microbe Hunter, if that's correct. Um, and they teach you about it. But generally, yeah. search, if you start searching and searching for things like, um, you know, fungal hypha or... Um, bacteria, but maybe put in things like 400x, which is the magnification level, that can sometimes help narrow the search down to, to videos where it's more looking at stuff rather than somebody just talking about it. Fab, thanks. I guess it's quite a lot of good stuff, but also quite a lot of bad stuff out there, isn't it? It's going to be hard to sort of yeah. sift through it. Uh, Hugh, you've got your hand up. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, hey, Colin, that was, that was a great, great talk. Um, we enjoyed that. Um, just uh, just out of curiosity, you know, I, I missed the first ten minutes. Sorry, coming on to your presentation, so you might have covered this. But what what was your what was your motivation for going down this learning journey, going through the soil food web? You know, was it curiosity? Was it financial? And and how easy have you been finding it, applying it to to your own your own context? Yeah, no, I actually didn't cover that. So that's a, a good question. I'm. What got me curiosity, I guess, 
I'm, I'm genuinely incredibly curious, you know, and I think I think the engineering kind of um, amps that curiosity up uh, when you when you study engineering and stuff. And I'm when I when I came to the farm, um, when, when we bought this place in 2014, I was still engineering. I wasn't there was no intention necessarily to farm. It was more just to have some land and maybe a few animals and be a bit self sufficient. Um, but I didn't. I well, grew up in a farm and it was a conventional farm. I never really took much to do with it. Um, so I didn't really have many preconceptions of farming, you know, in terms of the standard practice that you do. So I kind of came to it from a fresh mind. So when I, when I started asking myself questions, I would then just basically go online and start researching those questions. And um, I very quickly was able to find, you know, regenerative uh, groups and, and, and people that are talking about the regenerative ways. And I guess they just spoke to me. You know, I'm what they're saying made a lot of sense um, because I didn't have all these kind of preconceived notions of things. There's, I'm not fighting my inner knowledge, you know, so yeah. that made it a lot easier, certainly. Um, and then kind of once you get to a point in that rabbit hole of regenerative agriculture, for me, there was just no going back, you know. But I, I always ask why. That's one of the things I say, you know, my parents growing up always said they, all, all I ever did was ask why, 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 why. Um, so when I got out there, I said, well, why is this happening? Why is that happening? And really, when you look online, a lot of times it's really hard to get an answer. Um, and then I, I come to realise that actually everything, the basis of everything is the soil, you know? So at that point, when I realised that, I thought, right, I want to I want to look more into the soil. You know, I want answers. Um, and, you know, even, even just, what was this, 26? 16, 2017, something like that. Even then, we're way, way miles on now, you know, in terms of getting information. There's so much yeah. more out there already, or so much more accessible. Um, so yeah, just try to find those answers. And then coming across Elaine Ingham's work, and then the more people I listen to about soil, the more she's constantly referenced. And then I realized she had a school, and I thought, oh, this is it. You know, I so the intention was to learn this for myself. And just for the farm, I'm um, just to apply here. But now that I've done it, and then I've, I'm doing the lab tech course, I've realised I'd probably quite like to do that as well, or, or, or you know, have that as another, as a potential another income stream to be able to do tests for people, um, and potentially be able to, to to help people in some way, you know, improve their soils. And um, because there's just still so little understood about it, um, and once you're in it, it 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 kind of feels so natural. You know, um, and, and so obvious when you look at it and things make sense, you can ask questions and get answers, you know. So, um, yeah, I've, and I've really enjoyed it, you know, really enjoyed it. So I hope that answers point. your question, Drew. Sorry. No, it does. Look, I've just started the Solid Food Bob course on the um, yep. foundation level. And um, so I know that the pass mark for progressing to the level you're going to is pretty high so well done on you for getting through that because oh, I'm, like, I'm finding it challenging that's for sure <laughs> yeah and it takes a bit of getting used to but um once you get into it it's, it's good it's good fun it's a bit intense at the start you know definitely yeah. the first few chapters are pretty pretty head on <laughs> no, it cheers, gets thanks easier. <laughs> yeah no cheers thanks for that you're welcome and that's coming from someone that's done all the holistic management training, Hugh. So <laughs> <laughs> well, I found the holistic management fundamentals quite challenging to get through. Um, oh, it is. Oh, it is. It is it's, it's challenging, definitely. <laughs> oh, God. Send me to sleep a little bit. Anyway, um, <laughs> Peter Morton, you've asked how many tests under a microscope would you consider necessary to say you understand the soil microbiology of an acre? I assume that's, for example, as a unit of measurement. So... Presuming that's test holes across. If I'm thinking it's it's the yeah okay yeah I think it, it might use. I think I understand that. Um, if you're taking uh if you're taking an acre, and the acre is broadly like the same, you know, it's a bit of pasture, and there's no real variation in the pasture. Um, then you know the pasture has the same kind of species in it. Um, that you're seeing there's no there's no differences you know it's not bare patches or patches full of weeds and patches of lovely lush grass if it's all pretty uniform then you could take you could take you know five six seven samples I'm um, out, out of that and send it and, and we look at it as one sample I'm um, but when we're looking at when we're looking at samples and um, through a microscope we don't need massive chunks of soil you know 
my my tool is an apple corer, you know. So I go out with an apple corer, and all I try to do is pull away the the vegetation on the ground, shove the apple corer in, and that gives me a kind of four to six inch, you know, core. And that's what we're concerned with is that first like four to six inches, because that's where the most biology is going to be, because that's where the most roots are. So if it's not in there, it's not going to be any further down. Um, but you can take, you know, core samples, um, and then you would basically just take them out, you put them in a bag, um, seal the bag or try and leave it open if you can a bit, depending on if you're delivering it personal or mailing it, you know, and then we just take that and we mix that bag up and look at that as one sample. Um, but if there's variation in the land, if there's an area with a lot of weeds and there's an area not, then what, what you want to do is you want to look at the area that doesn't and then you want to look at the area with weeds and do two separate analysis and go, why is that area weedy, you know? Or just or just the weed area and say what's wrong here and we can look at that and go okay you know here's what we're finding and possible ways to remediate that um so it, it doesn't it doesn't have to be masses of samples you know um you know and and i, I should say that sampling is you know we, we're to do it to do a sample is 80 pounds and that's not that's not cheap from soil sampling points of view you know you can do lots of samples but what I would say is the information that you'll get from this is incredibly valuable, you know. I'm even just as a one-off to go, okay, I know where I am, you know. And then if you do one sample the following year, you can see how your progression is, you know. I'm even as an indicator, if you're not, you know, if you're not wanting to apply biology and stuff, you want to do regenerative practice, even as an indicator to see is it is it going in the right direction, you know? Um so yeah, one one sample an acre would be fine. I'm a massive fan of soil mentor as well and just you know yes, learning to understand yeah. your own soils just by looking at them feeling them smelling them etc getting you know, up Absolutely. close and personal with the soil um Malcolm asked there what was the name of the course you did and where would we enroll if interested um so it's a soil food web school um <clears throat> soilfoodwebschool.com it's Elaine Ingham's uh, business in America so she if, if you don't know who she is she pioneered um, in like the 80s uh, so well she, she was pioneering going what is this we know nothing about it and then she started looking um, into it and she started looking at all these microbes she's a she's a biologist a microbiologist and she started looking at all these microbes and going we have no idea what, <clears throat> what these microbes are doing you know and then she went from there and I think her first paper on like soil microbes and how they interact with plants was in like the mid 80s you know so way ahead of the curve Um. So yeah, you can really, you can also, there's also um, uh, Nicole Masters as well, um, Integrity Soils, um, phenomenal uh, woman as well for, for uh, soil. Um, she has courses as well. She has an, a basic and a master class and a horse course that, that are also really good because they're more aimed at the farmer looking to understand his soils without getting really deep into the actual biology whereas Elaine Ingham's is incredibly focused on the scientific detail of the individual you know organisms in the soil and um, whereas she's telling you more to go and dig a hole and here's what to look for etc so that may appeal to more people um as well Nicole also uh, co-developed soil mentor I believe so sorry yes that's right yeah she yeah. said that yeah she could could yeah, help that with um Vida cycle and her and her book uh, for the love of soil is excellent uh, best, Jamie, best read, best read. Jamie has asked, what effects have you observed from micro application on your farm? I'm actually not. I'm, I'm just getting to that point now. Um, we have been, we're, we're basically in the process of making compost and getting compost that have the biology we need. So we've assessed our soils and our soils are bacterially rich. Um, I think as a lot of soils are. Um, and we're now at the point of just making the applications now but it's not going to be until next spring into next summer before we're actually going to start seeing anything or, 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 or no, knowing the results you know and and a lot of times it can take like two and three applications a year to start getting the microbes in um so yeah not 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 observed any effects yet but it's, it's just because it's too early um to know so next year will be the teller year you know when we see um, and at this point in the year now, you know, the, the soils are starting to go to sleep. So you don't, you know, you would assess kind of early autumn and into spring when everything gets its first kind of 
burst of energy. That's when you generally want to test your soils. Um, so, excuse me. And um, yeah, so unfortunately, <laughs> I'm I'm just in the, literally in the final stages of finishing my 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 uh, lab tech. Um, so um, I've just been working on compost piles and getting that right. And that's a bit of a that's a science in itself. Um, so we've made a, quite a few field compost piles. I'm um, trying to get the right materials and stuff. And now we're getting to the point where they're getting good. But the problem we have is, is we need we need fungal uh, dominant compost to start getting the fungi back in. And that can take six months to a year, you know, so um, depending on the compost. And as we make more, they'll get better and better because we can back inoculate. Um, so we're just, it just takes time right now. So we're hoping by spring we'll be in the position to start really putting out those fungal rich composts, you know, and, and seeing, seeing how that how that translates. But I know from, from Elaine's work, you know, she spoke about, and, and they speak quite often about things like um, compaction. And they're going in and spraying ground with compaction, and in four months, they're you know they're taking a they're taking a, a penetrometer rod and they, they're jumping on it, can't get it in the ground. Spraying biology in four months, straight down, you know. So uh, you know, I, I gather that it can be pretty quick, you know, uh, um, in, in transition. But um, the thing you got to be wary of is all of these a lot of these cases are in America, Australia, hot countries, you know. So translating that to a generally wetter climate, um, it'll be interesting to see. See how that goes. Uh, Daniel in the chat, you said that you have got some experience um, of a of kind of effects on your on your lands. You, do you want to unmute and and share? Yeah. Uh, hi everyone. Sorry, they, they want to um to hijack it. No, we it's a sharing. It for, sharing. Uh, Sharing's good. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've we've uh, we've done a, a, a couple experiments. First one we did was last year on spring barley. So we did a half a hectare trial on spring barley. We did three applications, three spray applications, and uh, it was a control trial, uh, double, uh, two replicates with controls. And the, um, the conventional side uh, got, I think if I remember correctly, between five, five and six tons Per hectare, we got up to about four and a half tons with biology, and then control was down at like two, two and a half tons. So I think we we beat the control by uh, forty percent in in the first sort of year, and that was just purely agricultural land uh, that's been in use, you know, with fer with fertilizers and with fungicides, with everything else, fully glyphosated. You know, from from year one. So uh, that was our first one. Uh, this year we we completed winter wheat on five hectares. Um, we've managed. We, it wasn't a control trial. We did it like a half and a half, and the uh, the field wasn't. So it was a different field. It was uh, almost like outdoor hydroponics. So it worked very well with um, with synthetic nutrients. It got up to eleven point four tons on synthetic synthetic nutrients. And we got 4.9 tons on biology. Um, we didn't control any weeds with glyphosate or anything like that, which means that we had a lot of weed pressure, actually. Um, how did still, you, sorry to interrupt you, Daniel, just, just ask you quickly, how did you, did, did you find a lot of weed pressure on the biology side? Yep. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's, it was, it's difficult to, um, in in our experience, it's still very difficult to want um, to, to control um, weeds with um, with biology only. Uh, so it's it's something that um, we don't see it as a as a full solution. Basically, you know, like Elaine shows in this example of um, spring onions, for instance, in New Zealand, where they spray and you know there's there's no there's no weed pressure on it. But it it hasn't been our experience. Um, it's it's not as simple as that. I don't think. Um, but there is, but it's not to say that it's wrong. I actually, after that experience, I did a little ex experiment in uh, in pots, and I took the weeds, the prevailing weed um, seeds that were growing in the field, and I've put them into compost with different fungal to bacterial biomass ratios. And at the time, we had like the, the highest fungal to bacterial biomass ratio compost we had was sixteen to one. 
So we basically had a gradient from like 16 to one fungal to biomass ratio all the way down to fully bacterial compost. And you could see that the highly fungal compost was the last compost that the, the, the weeds actually grew. And they like very little, and we're talking late spring. So it was quite warm. It was on, you know, concrete. So they had good conditions to, um, to, to grow. And so in the ones that basically were bacterial, they, they grew quickly. But in the ones where they were fungal, they didn't. So it's the, the other thing that we noticed also is that majority of the new biology that established established mostly in the roots of the plants uh, of the wheat that we are growing. So if you were to simply apply it to um, to to sort of this really abused soil, um, you know, it's 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 a bit of a work to um, to actually get it to establish across the whole soil profile. You need that sort of you, you mentioned in the presentation it's best to have like a full soil cover it's it's easier to work on pastures i think because of that and then um so we actually found that there was fungi growing but it was actually growing in in the root zone so if we just took samples from between plants like uh, also elaine sometimes actually teaches that you need to sort of like take it between the center of the plant and the drip line uh if we did that then it was just strictly bacterial. There was nothing that nothing really showing. But if you actually took uh, a wheat plant and actually then disassembled the, uh, the the roots, you actually find that your know, nematodes that you applied and a bit of bit of fungi actually established in there. So there's um, there's there's a there's a few tricks basically. And then we did um, then some other people did some trials for us. Um, uh, there were people in Scotland actually that did a pasture trial that was actually very interesting. Like the Hector, um, that, that, that trial was actually run by another student of, of Elaine's as well. And um, they did a Hector where they did a bit of a checkered sort of um, plan and they had different treatments of this. Um, they had different things they applied to this and they also had different treatments of this though. So there was uh, parts which were um, uh, ripped, there were parts which were sprayed, there were parts which, parts which, which were grazed. And uh, across basically they had uh, some biology that we sold to them and then um, nitrogen fertilizer, 50 kilograms a hectare, and then also um, seaweed extract. And the, the biology basically, uh, Across across all the other treatments, basically of the soil, showed they was trailing the uh, nitrogen application in terms of biomass measured with a um, with a plate biomass meter, and so it was just it was just below us. Everything it was just below it. Everything else was was below the biology. Um, the one thing that we have so far not been able to um, to help is actual protein content. So uh, for us, it was great on barley because actually brewers like low protein content, but um, for, the, uh, for the wheat, obviously that uh, doesn't give you the, uh, the, the milling uh, premium. So we didn't, we didn't get that. And on the pasture it was also visible that basically on the pasture, there was a low protein content on the biology. So it's something that we're looking to address. Um, we'll be doing some uh, controlled trials in a tent uh, that everybody's laughing that I'm, be, I'm gonna be growing something else in, uh, but I promise I'm not that insane yet. And um, so we're hopefully in January, we're gonna be putting some, some uh, wheat seeds that we're actually getting from Scotland, um, right. from an organic farm. Where are you farm based, Daniel? Southern. We're in Hampshire in, in the South. Hampshire, nice. But we've got, we've, and... got, uh, we've got lots of friends in Scotland, so. Brilliant. It's, yeah, fascinating. Can you could you post a link to your organization in the chat so we can check, yeah, check sure. it out and follow sure, you up yeah, to? But I, I can I can do that. I don't, I, again, I don't want to hijack anything. I'm, I'm no really worries. glad to see that um, there's other people, you know, playing with this and we're here to help and, and chat. So um, anytime. Brilliant. Thanks. Um, and yeah. we are we are racing towards the uh, the sort of finishing time at, the, at this point. There was one other question, um, and I know Diana was uh, keen to move us to the final mentee, but there was one other question about spraying. Um, where's it gone? Da -da -da -da. 
La, la. So Claire, Claire had chatted to a farmer this week who had said that spraying compost teas would kill most of the most of the microbes due to the high water pressure. I have no experience of this. Anyone know if it's true? I mean, it's a bit of few responses in the chat. I guess it depends on well the water pressure, surely. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> use a final spray. It can, it, surely. <laughs> yeah, it, it can. I'm the, the main the main concerns with spraying. I'm um, are minimize your bends, so like ninety degree bends. Um, they, they say that every time it goes around 90 degree bend, you lose 50% of your microbes. Um, and also keep your keep your water pressure kind of as they say they say 80, no more than 80 to 100 psi. But if you can keep it lower, just keep it lower because the less pressure you have, the better. But the the best way to um assess that is basically to make the tea and put it in whatever equipment you're going to use and spray it. And what to do is if go and spray it in the ground, just spray it in, but set set a dish or something on the ground and sp and spray over it, and then collect some liquid in the dish, and then immediately just go and put it under a microscope, and you will see straight away if everything's died or not, you know. Um. So, and if it has, then you need to you need to rethink the system. So yeah, you have to be careful. You, um. A lot of conventional systems because they're not concerned with biology have a lot of bends and tight turns and things like that, and the pressures maybe a lot higher because they're trying to mist and things like that. So yeah, that plus plus you can't you need to have a, a a big opening. I think I think it's like minimum like eight hundred micron, like up to a mil opening size. Otherwise, the biology a lot of the biology can get trapped and stuck, or, or the nozzles can get blocked. A lot of people say they get blocked nozzles the compost tea, you know. So got it filtered as well. I can imagine you would do, yeah. Yeah. Wow, um, this has been brilliant. It's uh, but it is nearly half past eight. Um, there's been loads of good chats in in the chats. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for participating. Uh, I'm just going to hand over to Diana for the last uh, Mentimeter, um, which is like the, uh, what do you call it, evaluation bit. Thank you, Avi. And thank you, Colleen, for such an informative presentation. I learned so much and I'm sure everyone else did as well. And it would be really great to capture some of that learning. So I shared a link on the chat to Mentimeter. And if you could just follow that link and we're going to, I'm going to share my screen so you can see what people are saying as well and uh, so the question we want to ask you now is what did you find the most useful about the session and also if you would rather use the chat please feel free to use the chat instead Understanding the interactions between different organisms, very informative, all the ideas and knowledge, further highlighting the benefits of looking after soils, all very good. Informative detail into soil biology and application methods, everything that's been shared on the podcast that has been really cool as well, all the knowledge sharing that has been going on also in the chat. And I'm gonna move us on to the next question, but if you're still writing this one, you can just continue. And so the next question we want to ask you, so we asked you at the beginning how confident you would feel explaining the soil food web to someone else. And now we want to ask you the same question right now after this um, workshop. Well, four of you would feel completely confident. So that's that's great to see people feeling more confident after we've been through this. Again, please feel free to use the chat. Oh, and I see that someone is drawing. That's cool. <laughs> Great. Fairly confident we have in the chat. Great. It's good to see. Nice. So fairly confident we see. Great. Perfect. Um, and the last question we want to ask you is, um, is there anything that you've learned today that you might want to try out in your own farm, croft, or market garden, piece of land, um, windowsill, maybe? Is 
Soil biology testing, making compost extra extracts and teas. Uh, in the chat, I will def be getting the microscope out to see what I can see. Yeah, lots of lots of microscope sales. Sales will be going up. <laughs> Great. Well, I'm gonna stop sharing now and just let Abby and Colleen do the closing. And thank you for that. Amazing. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, everybody. It's been uh, a fantastic hour and a half. Colin, you got any last words, Colin? Yeah, yeah. I hope this has inspired people to go and look at soil. You know, it's, it is our most precious resource on the planet, bar none. You know, every civilization ever collapsed started with the collapse of their soil, you know. So we really need to look after it. So, yeah, if this is inspires people to just go and have a look and, and get a wee bit more into it, that's, that's great. That's all I wanted, you know, which is to try and sp spread some more word about it, you know. The more people that spread it, the better. So Spread some of the soily love. Can't say it better than that. Uh, do check out the Agroecology Enabling the Transition website. The next webinar is all about chickens. Um, and it's the pasture poultry uh, webinar. It's on next week. Colin's part of that group as well because <laughs> he's got chickens. Uh, and that's um, that's Diana posting it in the chat just there. Thank you, everybody. You've been great. Enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>